Open our hearts that you put out any distraction in our minds. And Lord, you go and speak to us today. God, that you might use your servant, you'd use me, speak through me. And Lord, we pray for those who are in need today, that you bring comfort to them, healing to them, and peace to them as well. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have a job, you started with a knowledge of what your job was going to be, but somebody had to train you. You might understand the philosophy of your position. You might understand the inner workings. But somebody from your company said, this is how we do things here. We've got to train you how to do things. When I worked at Einstein Bagels, I love sharing this story. I shared it yesterday. I want to share it with you guys today. I was a shift manager with a polo. That means I made 25 cents more an hour than my counterparts with t-shirts. I was 18 years old. I thought I was hot stuff. I thought I I was taking over the world. I was taking over the bagel world on Academy in Wyoming, that's for sure. And we would train new employees. I was in charge of bringing new employees on, interviewing them, and then teaching them everything to do. Yeah, yeah, you need to clean. You need to put away bagels. You need to put out fresh coffee. But this is how we do it. I needed to train them. And so I would take the guys and the gals on their very first day, and I'd start showing them the inner workings of bagels and then we get to the nitty gritty. It's time to clean the restrooms. I'd take them to the guy's bathroom with all the supplies, and I would put all the supplies down. I'd say, now you watch me, okay? I'm going to clean the guy's restroom. And meanwhile, I'd have one of my counterparts sneak out a pumpernickel bagel. It's kind of like a black bagel, a brownish bagel. It's uh, disgusting pre-cooked and post-cooked. I don't know who eats pumpernickel, but uh, it, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty gross. And it, it, it comes frozen, and the night before we had had it laid out so it de-thaws, and we would unwind that bad boy, and I would say, your job is to go into the girl's bathroom, and I just want you to leave a little surprise for the new trainee today. Just put it on the rim and hang it down the end of the toilet, okay? And I teach them how to do the boys' bathroom. I say, I'm a manager. I've got the polo. I'm very busy. I need to go do other things. You go ahead and do what I just did. You go into the girls' restroom and you just clean it up. I did the dirty, stinky boys' bathroom. You get the clean, good girls' bathroom and set them up big time, right? Big time. And they would go in and start cleaning the mirrors and you'd hear the screeches. <gasps> The girls would come out and they would say, I quit, I can't do it, I can't do it. And I'd say, what's wrong? You don't know what's in there. You don't know what's in there. And I would go in and say, oh, and bare hand, you know, no blood. And I'd grab the pumpernickel bagel. I'd say, it's just, just take it like this and put it back in. It's flush. Wipe it off and wash your hands and get back to work. <laughs> Oh, I love messing with some people right there. That was a good way to get them acquainted to a dynamic that they would be experiencing at Einstein Bagels. <laughs> Training day is always a really fun day. It's a day of new discoveries, a day of empowerment. It's a day that sets you free to be able to go out and not have someone looking over your shoulder. And the scripture tells us that we need to be trained in discipleship. We need to be trained and equipped in discipleship. Over the last nine or so weeks, we've been describing what a disciple is. And today, I want us all to be empowered to take this tool with us on how to disciple someone else. Pop quiz, Anchor Church. Who are you intentionally discipling? Who are you intentionally discipling? Who are you spending time with, investing your life into, not just watching ball games or eating dinners, but saying we are going to move forward together spiritually? I love seeing people grow in their faith. When I was a young 15-year-old called to ministry, I had people pouring their lives into me, not just mentoring me, but discipling me, teaching me how to be a multiplier, how to take what they've learned and apply it to my life and teach others how to do the very same thing. That's the call. Billy Graham passed away. We had a great celebration of his life. We honored him in tribute with a video last week. And we love Billy Graham tights because we see two million people coming to listen to him in New York City. And we hear thousands upon thousands of giving their lives to Christ at one event. But Billy Graham 
is gone. God may raise up an evangelist of that great nature again, but he's already got an entire army of people that can share their faith with one other person. That if today each Christian was intentional in discipling someone who was a non-Christian and that they became a follower of Christ, we'd be blowing Billy Graham numbers out of the water. We would be joining God and expanding his kingdom right here on earth. And some people just don't know where to start. I love sharing Christ with people. I go to Starbucks, not because I like the coffee. In fact, I took eight months off of coffee this last year. And I tried my very first coffee, and guess what it was? It was a, it was a, a car wash coffee. The Mr. Car Wash coffee. I had a decaf Mr. Car Wash coffee. Then the next morning, I tried Starbucks coffee. And what was better? The decaf Car Wash coffee was better. And so I go to Starbucks, not for the coffee, but to meet people and to share Christ. This week, I was able to share Christ with four different people. My faith just coming out from conversations, simple conversations. Many of us don't know where to start. So, Jared, where would I start? And it's so simple. People love to talk about themselves. That's kind of why I'm a pastor. I have to get on stage and you guys have to listen. I just talk about myself and the word of God. It's great. I ask this question. It's a great question that each of us should ask. What's most important to you? You can start by saying, what do you live for? What is most important to you? Oh, people do not mind sharing what's most important to them. They love to talk about what they do for a living. They love to talk about their family. They love to talk about how they work on cars or how they enjoy reading or writing or music. They love to start right here. And this is that opportunity that they are just setting you up for. Because you get to say, well, can I tell you what's most important to me? What I love, I, I love my job and I love my family, but there's, there's something that trumps all of that, and that's my relationship with Jesus. And once God starts to lead you down that road, this open door back and forth gives you a great opportunity to share about your faith and to share scripture. Paul writes in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15, and he says this. He says, and he died for all so that those who live might not longer live for themselves, but for him who their life's sake died and who was raised. <coughs> this is our opportunity when we get asked the question, what do you live for? You can take them right to 2 Corinthians 5.15. Maybe that's a verse you start to memorize. If you want to be a disciple and a disciple maker, it's imperative that you put God's word in your heart and on your mind so that at any point you have a ready defense to share your faith so that when they ask what's important to you, you say, I'll tell you what's important to me. It's my relationship with Jesus so that I no longer would live for myself, but that I could live for Christ who died for me. And John chapter 10, verse 10 says there's this massive plan that God has for us. And this plan is combated by the enemy. And this world is discipling us, whether we like it or not. They disciple us through the media, through our education system. They disciple us in the workplace. They disciple us through politically correct statements. They disciple us through all kinds of different mediums, music, art, everything. And so if we are not careful, we'll fall into the attack of the enemy that says the thief, Satan, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to annihilate your life and your relationship with God. But the but that's in here, the transition, Jesus says, I have come so that they may have life and life of Abundantly. I'll tell you what's most important to me. My relationship with God is most important to me because Jesus died for me and he has come to give me life, but not a crummy life, not a life that is unsatisfied, not a life that is boring and lame, but he came to give me the very best possible life that I can live. A 
Are you living that very best possible life that God has given you? That doesn't mean you won't have trials or suffering or difficulties or illness or sickness. But in the midst of those circumstances, you know that you serve the creator of the universe and he is greater than your circumstances. And you live for something greater than your circumstances. And so you won't be dissuaded in the midst of that pain and struggle. You are still living the very abundant life that he came to give you. We ask, what's most important to you? And, and another question that you can ask is, well, this suffering you're talking about, even though you, you have this great life in the midst of some struggles and difficulty, uh, where does this suffering come from? You might ask them. You might say, what causes the problems in this world? People love to talk about the problems in their home life, on the work site, at school, they love to talk about problems globally. They love to talk about problems in politics. Maybe some of us like to talk about those problems, too. Let's talk, talk more about solutions than problems, if, you're, if you ask me. But, but if you ask them what causes all these problems in this world, it begins to make them think. We don't like the policies in place. We don't like the evil in this world. We don't understand why all this is happening. You can say, well, aren't we all just like that? Are we all just like the politicians in our own way that we all stumble? There's times when we're selfish, self-seeking, where we falter, where we don't live up to the expectations of those around us, where we cause others harm. We're honest, we all struggle just as much as they do. You see, we are problem people as well. And Romans chapter 3 tells us this. In Romans verses 3, 10 through 12, it says, No one is righteous, not one. I love sharing about this. And some of us dwell on our testimony, our story of faith, on this a little bit too long. We glamorize the past without even giving light to the God who saved us from it. But we all need to share our faults. We need to express that we are sinners. It is a compliment when people tell me, you're not very pastoral. <laughs> it shouldn't be. But I really take that as a compliment. Like you're a little different. In fact, one of the guys I was talking with this week says, you're willing to talk about your sin and your struggles and your difficulties. And I think we all should. We don't want to glamorize it, but if we come with an approach of I have a solution for your problems because I've figured it out and I've arrived, people don't want to hear it. They're never going to take that step towards faith in Christ and a disciple of Jesus because they see it as unattainable and you as unapproachable. And we all need to wrestle with this and say, yeah, we've all sinned. No one is righteous, not even one. Verse 11 says, no one understands and no one seeks God apart from themselves. And verse 12 says, all have turned aside. Together they've become worthless no one does good, not even one. What this verse and passage is setting up a premise is that what we think is good is considered filthy rags to God. The book of Isaiah, it says our very best work, what we consider good to God, it is considered filthy rags. This is simply saying nobody measures up to the holiness, the grandeur, the perfection, the majesty, and the glory of God. Hagios, holy, is set apart. God is distinct then. He's different than us. He's on a whole other level. He is God Almighty. We don't compare. We are low compared to him. Our very best works don't measure up in the slightest to God's holiness. Very encouraging. I'm glad you're telling me how, how much a sinner I am, Jared. And I'm really encouraged by it. The beauty is Jesus. He is God. He was righteous. He is righteous. And he's our righteousness for us. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 8, it says, For whatever I've gained, I've counted loss for the sake of Christ. 
Indeed, I count everything a loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I suffered the loss of all things and count them rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. You want to abandon gaining personal righteousness and you want to pursue Christ. You get to gain so much more on that side. You now have the righteousness of God living in you, covering your sins, taking that away. Hey, what causes all these problems in this world? It's you and it's me. We do. We cause the problems. But there is a solution. It is in Christ. And if you're afraid of losing friends or family or a job or a position here on earth, or you're afraid of losing your viewpoint, your worldview, it's rubbish compared to gaining Christ. In Christ, you've got hope. In Christ, you have power. In Christ, you've been given the gifts of the Spirit. You've been given the fruit of the Spirit. In Christ, you've got salvation. In Christ, there's so much more. As you begin to develop in them this greater understanding of who they are, they're going to see and they're going to be pointed to a greater understanding of who God is. Sharing Christ is really not about a method. It's not about a one, two, three step. It's not about following some plan, but it's really about saying, hey, I need a proper view of who I am and a proper view of who God is. And if we can get a proper view of who I am and who God is, that should lead us to a response. Many will respond with giving their lives over to God. Some will still reject. In Isaiah 59.2, it tells us this, our inequities, our sin, our iniquities have made a separation between you and God. And you and your sins have hidden his face and has hidden his face from you so that he does not hear you. In Isaiah 59, it tells us that our sin creates a separation between us and God. That our, our prayers, that kind of bounce off the ceiling to God at times because we have got a block in front of our relationship with him. And it's our sin that needs to be dealt with. And if you want to know that God, you've got to deal with that sin. You've got to give it up to him and ask him to forgive you. That's where we come to, is there a solution to this problem? A third question on the process of discipleship that you can ask a person is, what's the solution? This week I talked to a guy that thought, well, I don't know, maybe Muslims have the solution, or Mormons have the solution, or Buddhists have the solution. Don't they all really say the same thing anyway and lead to the same place? I said, oh no, I'm so sorry, they, they don't. They don't. Buddhism doesn't even have a God. Islam believes that Jesus was just a man or a prophet. Mormonism believes that Jesus and Satan were <laughs> brothers. All of those other religions are works-based. They have something in common, though. What they do share, that they all share in common, is that you have to work for righteousness. You have to work for a holiness. You have to work for a rival. But in Christianity, it's very different. It's not your works, but it's the works of God. God came to you. You don't have to go to God. Yes, there is a solution. The solution is found in John 14, 6. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is saying, I'm the way to heaven. I'm the solution. In Romans chapter 4, 25, it says that he who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised from the dead for our justification. It's in Christ that we are made right with God. In Romans chapter 6, 23, it tells us the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. That is there a problem? Yeah, it's us, it's me, it's our sin, it's you, it's our sin. Is there a solution? Yes, it's in Christ. Our sin is going to give us hell and separation from God, but salvation in Christ gives us forgiveness of sins and a home in heaven. The solution is in Christ. So what's the response? What should your response be? 
you take them to Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10, that tells us this. Because if you confess with your mouth and believe that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Verse 10 tells us this. It says, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. In Acts chapter 3, verse 19, it says, repent therefore and turn again that your sins might be blotted out. Our response should be a change a transformation, an asking of God to forgive us, a belief in him as Jesus and Lord and a commitment to that. When we do that, we start this journey. I want to show you up here just a little timeline. There's kind of two directions that you might be going. You might be going further away from the cross or you might be going closer to the cross. And discipleship starts here. It starts here. That, that if you're far away from the Lord, you are separated from God, you're living in a dominion of darkness, you've got no home in heaven. And, and this is where you can make contact with that person, that you can have that conversation we just did and share your faith, talk to them about the gospel. The gospel, not coming to church or good works, but the good gift from God of eternal life that's free for all. And when they make that point of, Commitment to Jesus, surrender to him as God of their life. Now they start moving closer and closer down this line from away from dominion of darkness and now living in the kingdom of God where they are a new Christian. They grow and they struggle in that growth and they are being trained towards maturity in Christ. A lot of us think that discipleship starts here. And that is a part of discipleship. But discipleship starts here. I can go to the other TV if I want. <laughs> it starts way over here. It starts before you know Jesus. Anchor Church wants to be a church that sees lives transformed by Jesus for the glory of Jesus. And if we're going to do that, we've got to start meeting with people that don't know the Lord. Your kids are a great example. They're not born saved just because you're a Christian. You start pouring into their lives, loving on them, showing them who Jesus is, teaching them the word of God, revealing his character to them, praying for them. You want to do that for your kids. You can do that for your friends, your coworkers. Yes, your enemies. Your enemies. You want to avoid your enemies at all costs. You don't want conflict in your life. That's not what God calls us to. Romans says that we are to be kind to our enemies, that we are to show them love. And the best way to show them love is show them God's love. So discipleship starts here, and the training begins. We continue to move forward on that continuum. Well, what is discipleship, really? In Matthew chapter 28, it gives us the Great Commission. Verse 18 tells us this, And Jesus came and said to them, All. Oh, Authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Verse 19 tells us this. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The words, as you go, could be a better translation for that word go. We are to be sent, but we have already been sent. We have a sphere of influence in our lives, family, friends, co-workers, a network online. We've got people in our lives that need to hear the gospel of Jesus. And so as we go to them, we take and carry the gospel, the truth of God with us. And we make disciples. We make disciples. We baptize them. That's an identification. If you are a follower of Jesus, claim to be a follower of Jesus, and you've never been baptized Let's do some baptisms on Easter. Let's baptize. We were given a free baptismal tank. We've got it. All I got to do is go pick it up. Let's fill it up and let's get you baptized because this is the first step of obedience that God's called you to. It tells you to be baptized before you know and understand and obey everything in the word of God. So if you're not a baptized follower of Jesus, why? Now's the time. The church will celebrate with you. We'll rejoice in that. 
We're your biggest fans. We'll help you overcome your fears of being in front of people or getting soaked with water. There's all kinds of different ways. We baptize in the river. We baptize there. We baptize in swimming pools. We'll go to a, 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 a shower and baptize you or something. We sprinkled a wheelchair-bound girl that could not get into a baptismal tank with water. There's all kinds of ways to express and show that you are a follower of Jesus. You can be immersed in Scripture. In baptismal waters, then yes, absolutely you should. And we should do that in front of the world today and let them know we're not ashamed to be a follower of Jesus. I wear a wedding ring because I love my wife Tasha and I don't want her to kill me. No, I'm kidding. I love her so much I'm not ashamed to be her husband. I want the world to know I'm a follower of, uh, I'm a fan of hers. And uh, if I'm not wearing this ring, I'm showing the world that I'm not married. Except for the tan line that's around it. They'll know. But when we are Christians and we aren't baptized believers, it's like we're saying, we're saved, we're going to heaven. This isn't a salvation issue, but we're just not letting the world know that we are committed to Christ. Let's put the ring on. Let's get baptized. Let's do that today. Let's walk in that first step of obedience. You don't have to understand it all. You don't have to know it all. You just have to be saved and free from your sin because the next part says, baptizing them in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything. It's teaching them to observe and obey everything that I've commanded you. Now we get in to another step of discipleship. Studying the Word of God together. It's opening up the scripture and putting it up towards our lives like a mirror. And when we look at that word of God, what is the reflection that we see in that mirror? Do we see more of ourselves and we see more of Jesus? And as we study the word of God together, we reveal to ourselves that we don't measure up as much as we thought we did. And there's some areas in our lives that God's got to go to work on and that we need to chisel away some things and that we're still struggling and growing and we deal with things and we overcome things, but then we realize we're going right back to it and we need the word of God to teach us how to live our lives. We study the scriptures. Then we start to learn then we figure out what it is we need to obey and what we need to follow and how the kindness of God's heart that he draws us to him with repentance in our hearts. It's his kindness that brings us to that place of repentance and change. He begins to change us and mold us and shape us into maturity in Christ. That is our goal, to be a mature follower of Jesus. We're not to be baby Christians forever. I'm so glad my kids are out of diapers, and some of us as Christians, we need to get out of diapers. We need to take steps towards faith in Christ and maturity in Christ. And the early church even struggled with this as well. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, after the Great Commission has been given by Jesus, Jesus gives them these words as well. This, this discipleship training, you take this with you. It says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Jerusalem would be Albuquerque, Judea and Samaria might be like Grants and Gallup or Moriarty. And the ends of the earth could be uh, going to Kenya with us this year, okay? The ends of the earth. Taking the gospel with you everywhere. There, there's, there's at home, there's nearby, there's a little bit further, and then there's the rest of the world. That's what we're called to do. But the early church, as they were sharing their faith, they were doing it in practice, but not in geography. Look at Acts chapter 8. If you have Acts chapter 8, we've got several chapters later that we see here. This is unfolding. It says, and Saul approved of his execution. This is the stoning of Stephen. Saul is going to be later changed to Paul and write most of the New Testament. He'll be awakened on the Damascus Road. But at this point, as we're reading, uh, persecution is happening to the church. And the church is multiplying, it's growing, and Saul is giving approval over the execution of Stephen, uh, the first Christian martyr in, in Acts 7. It says, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Sometimes God's got to shake us up. Towards maturity. 
Sometimes God's got to shake us up to move us towards maturity. When we're comfortable and everything's easy and it's clicking, I got my church family and friends, we got coffee and there's donuts, it's great, I love it, and there's nothing wrong with any of that, but we just kind of get in our groove and we're comfortable and we're like, I, I, I still like my diaper, I, I, I just, I'm comfortable, I'm okay here. They had not gone to Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. We're talking eight chapters later. A lot of stuff has happened. Time has gone by. Paul hasn't even been saved yet. This is still Saul. Paul's going to be like, what's wrong with you guys? Let's go. He's going to go on all his missionary journeys. And this is what we're going to get in Acts, the rest of this story. But it took some time. Shook them up. God scattered them through persecution. Persecution hit hard in Jerusalem. Boom. The dysphoria. They would be dispersed all over the world to share their faith. We need to take steps towards that maturity. We need to follow as God has called us to. So I asked at the very beginning, who are you discipling? Who are you discipling? Are there things going on in your life? God might be shaking you up just a little bit to get you on this path towards discipleship. I want to show you guys what should be happening at the cross. At the cross, we, we had that salvation continuum. At the cross, our, our understanding of God should be getting bigger and bigger. Can you, can you guys see this? Conversion happens right there. And as we grow in maturity, our growing awareness of who God is should be getting larger and larger in our minds. We should be seeing God as bigger and grander and mightier and more majestic. And at the same time, our awareness of our flesh and our sinfulness, we should realize how much lower and lower we really are. We should see that in our lives. Like growing towards maturity doesn't mean that you get better. Growing towards maturity doesn't mean that you become a better Christian, a holier Christian. Like you've got all the holiness you need in Jesus. But as you grow in maturity towards Christ, you should realize that, yeah, I thought I was something, but I'm really realizing. I know the intentions of my heart. God knows me better than anybody else. I can fool others around me, but that's how low I really am in my need of God. In the cross, in your mind, the gospel, it should just grow. It should get bigger and bigger and bigger. As you grow in maturity, God will shake you up at times. He'll reveal things about yourself. And what it should do is give you a bigger picture of the gospel in your life. <clears throat> and we should be working towards this, this wheel in our lives spiritually where we're growing. Can you pull up the slide with the circle, the wheel there, the, the kind of pie chart for me, Carrie? This is going to be difficult maybe for you to read. I'm going to put these up online. But over here, we discover new life in Christ. We're at that infant stage. We're learning new habits. We're learning new truths about Jesus. But as we grow in love for God, we become a child of God. That We begin to grow in our relationships. And we see that we shouldn't be self-centered. We should be others Centered, And as we grow with a servant's heart, we realize we're a disciple of Jesus that's serving God and others. That now we're becoming a young adult. We're going to seek training. We're going to seek advanced equipping. We might join a community group. We've got one going on next service at 1030 in the atrium. Free child care. Learning about the Ten Commandments. We're going to start one on Tuesday nights going through a Dave Ramsey study. How to do biblical finance. There's a young adult one that we're starting this spring. We've got groups on Wednesday and Thursday for married families with kids. There's a women's group. There's all kinds of ways to take steps towards more advanced training. And community groups is a great place to do that. If you're not in a community group, we invite you to check one out. Find one on our website that would work best for you. Grow. Start to exercise godly stewardship with your time, talents, and your treasure. All the things we've been talking about for nine weeks. But the parent phase, the parent phase, that's when you become one who's a disciple maker. Where you are now applying all that you've learned and you're putting it into someone else. I've got some great books that can help you on discipleship. 
If you want to look, there's, there's some books. There's the Gospel-Centered Discipleship Life. There's the Spiritual Disciplines book by uh, uh, Donald Whitney. I love this book. It'll teach you how to have a relationship with God at a higher level. Uh, your Gospel-Centered Discipleship by J.K. Dodson. That's a really great book book that you guys would really enjoy. Multiply by Francis Chan is super simple, easy read. If you want to teach someone how to be a follower of Christ, take them through Multiply or even real life discipleship. This is an actual training manual. If you can't remember anything I said, you didn't write down any of those four questions, you don't remember the wheel, you can't picture the growth chart of the cross, just pick up this book, okay? Grab two of them, say, hey, I'm going to take you through this. Could we work through this? It's a workbook. It's a kind of a question and answer, read a Bible verse, talk about it approach. Put this into practice and see how God can use you. Because the single best thing, and this is an unknown quote, uh, but the single best thing that you can do with your time is to put it into someone else's life. The, the single best thing as a follower of Jesus, the single best con contribution that we can make in this life is passing our faith to the next generation. Another thing that you could do in order to pass your faith to the next generation is go back. Listen to every sermon over the last nine weeks. Take notes. Meet with that person you want to disciple. Say, this week, we're going to be talking about stewardship or serving God. We're going to talk about evangelism. We're going to talk about all the topics we've talked about. And you've already got a playbook. You've got 10 weeks of discipleship material. And when Jesus gave us the Great Commission, in Acts 1, when he sends us to the ends of the earth, it was a very simple statement. We see people cross over from darkness to light by sharing our faith. We make disciples. We identify ourselves as followers of Jesus in spiritual baptism. And we teach them the word of God. Here at Anchor, we have three steps in discipleship. We meet for corporate worship and the study of the word of God. Where God's got a message he wants to tell our whole church every week. He does. If you're out of town, when I go out of town, I get online and I listen. He's got a message for everybody in this church every single week. Corporate worship. Community groups. A place to make friendships, to connect, to center those relationships around the word of God and be on mission <laughs> together. And then being committed to one-on-one. -on -one. If you can do those three things, church, I will tell you that this year will look drastically different than the year before. It'll look drastically different than anything that we've ever experienced. If every one of us discipled one person, it would change the landscape. Let's picture that. What if we didn't live for ourselves, but we lived for a higher cause? What if we were intentional in our friendships and relationships and with our time and we weren't consumed by so many distractions and we weren't going to let the world disciple us. We were going to be discipled by God and disciple others. That could change us. Today was training day. I didn't play any tricks on you. I didn't take you to the girls' bathroom and leave a surprise for you. I was pretty kind. But we got training manual. Let's take it forward. Father God, we come to you, Lord, and we thank you for your living, active word that's super straightforward, at times incredibly complex, but is simple enough for a child to understand. Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit that interprets the word to us and teaches us what you mean and that we've got the author of the scriptures living inside of us, and that we can take what we know in the word of God, and we can share it with others. God, I know it's scary. I feel the same way every time I'm talking to someone about you. It's the most important thing to me. But Lord, I've already said no for a lot of people I talk to. I think that they don't want to hear it, that they're not interested, that they're going to argue with me. But oh man, 
so thankful for this week where you just remind me that if people are receptive, they are open, they need to hear this, they want truth, and they need to know you, and they, they want to know you, and that you're still at work making disciples. And God, lead us to those people. Let's watch them go from darkness to light. And Lord, as they become a follower of you, give us the courage and the commitment to stay by their side and to teach them to observe everything that you've commanded us in the scriptures. And Lord, may you do a work here at Anchor. I mean, a work. Let's get energized about this work kind of work, God, where we look back at this day and this moment, we go, thank you, God, for that work you've done. You're moving. You are changing people's lives. You are transforming this community. Lord, you're growing and expanding your kingdom, and you're growing your church here on earth. We want that, Lord. So our answer to you is yes. No delays. No distractions. No excuses. We are yours. We want to follow you. In Jesus' name.